Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 508, featuring an interview with Clint Basinger, also known as LGR, Lazy Game Reviews. Now, despite the name, Clint is anything but lazy. He's put together a staggering collection of videos about his staggering collection of vintage hardware games, gaming accessories, peripherals, you name it. This guy's probably got it somewhere in his collection. Now, he's doing uh, some really important work, in my opinion, anyway, archiving this stuff, preserving it, uh, putting the information out there for others like uh, you and me to pour over and savor. And I've known him for a long time. We basically started our YouTube channels about the same time. Uh, we've kept in touch, but uh, I thought it was long overdue, basically, to have him on my show and talk about all this stuff and his really impressive body of work. Uh, anyway, without we got a lot to cover, so without further ado, here is LGR. Hey guys, look who is with me this morning. It is Clint Basinger, LGR, Lazy Game Reviews, the man himself. I'm already <laughs> mesmerized just by the background stuff that you got in this uh, uh, this shot, Clint. It's yes. amazing. Let me just, uh, before we jump in, I want to show you the channel, just in case you're not familiar. I'm, I'm pretty sure most people that watch my channel probably watch LGR. They should. It looks like 1.66 million subscribers, 1.1K video. Wow, that's a lot of videos. <laughs> yeah, it's getting up there. Three a month, huh? Uh, yeah, like three or four, typically. I mean, just look at the variety of stuff on here. I mean, how can this is just like crack cocaine for people that are interested in vintage tech? Wow. Yeah. Jeez Louise, you're busy. Try to be. <laughs> how do you? <laughs> how do you do all this? Um, well, I think after doing it for like fifteen years now, it's just sort of like second nature. I don't know how to not do it. Oh, so, yeah. kind of feel like uh, this is just it's just me. I can't not be me. So I don't know. <laughs> it's sort of turned into a system after a while, you know. You just get into that groove, and as long as you can stay somewhere within it or, like, follow the groove wherever it wants to go, then, uh, yeah. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. I think we started doing YouTube about the same time, if I recall correctly. Honestly, yeah. Like, I know I started watching you, like, around the same time when I started. It was, like, 2010 or something. So, yeah, I I, I don't know. It's It's been a long time for both of us, for sure. Yeah, I don't know what your experience was was like on the production side. I mean, when I jumped into this, I was an absolute newbie at all yeah. things video. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, video, audio, the whole, I mean, you know, I feel like I'm still learning all the time. Like, I literally just set up a new microphone today, so hopefully it's good. <laughs> like, you know. Uh, and you had pointed out in a couple of interviews, I, I read some of those, and you were saying that really the audio can be the tricky, the trickiest thing. I still have that from time to time on videos is the is it the syncing is it just the quality oh man yeah it's i mean it's everything like you know how it is like you know you get into a different space or a different like you change the surroundings you have the camera in a different spot you have like because i used to have long hair hair would get on the mic right here like you oh, know there's yeah. all kinds of you know i had a beard down to here that that would like crinkle it you know like there's always something you're messing up or like shifting or changing with the environment or with you or with like with me the subject matter like i'm filming in front of a lot of crts and you get like crt wine and computer noise and all these different things so it feels like every single time i do something it's uh slightly different and i don't do too many like interviews or anything so it's like oh, i have to set something up for this so like i, I don't i don't want a thing here i don't want a thing here i should have it here so you know yeah i don't know i feel like i'm always uh messing something up and fixing it every other video <laughs> Yeah, I think people just have no idea of the time, all the behind the scenes stuff yeah. that, that has to take place. I mean, you'd mentioned the CRT. You know, they, they probably don't know what that what that means, but you know, you're trying to film an old monitor and you get this weird sort of I don't know how to describe it, like a line going across the screen, totally distracting. But you, you managed to solve that problem, right? With your I eventually and mostly it, it there are still, you know, certain situations where that doesn't work but yeah there's the uh, the difference between a camera shutter speed or shutter angle and the refresh of the crt and you'll start seeing that rolling line or flickering or anything like that so 
it depends like if you're if you're just like say filming console games or something which i don't really often do kind of wish i did sometimes because it would be easier but <laughs> yeah it's like 60 hertz so you need that refresh of 60 on your camera or the, the shutter speed but if it's slightly off then you start getting that flicker or rolling lines and so with crt monitors with a computer you know dos is like 15 different refresh rates that it can use so each one of those every time it goes to a different resolution or a different you know a menu will look one way a gameplay will look one way text will look one way the dos prompt will look one way window you know so uh yeah I'm constantly shifting the settings and i've gone through multiple cameras before settling on the the, the lumix gh5 series that i have right now so probably get one of those L lumix g what is it lumix yeah, the the uh, if I learn, can I learn from you? Darren? Uh, take take notes. Uh, I, I will have uh, you know this will all be outlined in the syllabus. So <laughs> oh, no. I, I never look at the syllabus. I know, right? Oh man, nobody wants to make one of those either. Uh, but yeah, it's like uh, it's a lovely little camera. It's a couple years old now, but uh, yeah, I I can't really feel feel like I'm stuck with it because it works so perfectly well for what I do. Uh, but you know. Yeah, it works. It just take, uh, it took a long time to get here in terms of figuring that out, that aspect of filming. Because for the long, I mean, I started off filming this on a VHS camcorder back in the day. So I've oh. kind of gone through the whole gamut. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of appealing, though, in a way. Just the other, I've always wanted to make some videos with a, with a video toaster, just some vintage <laughs> just yeah. for just for, just for the heck of it. Nah, same. Yeah, I was, uh, you know, talking about this, this, the difficulties of filming this stuff you know i've done a lot of game reviews i try to do a lot of vintage stuff too and i always just find there's like a certain <clears throat> usually the dos stuff you can get to run pretty well with dos box and you know, that's pretty well situated these days at least but yeah that early windows stuff you know there's still some games i've just never been able to get i mean maybe i can get it running okay to some semi play it <laughs> but filming yeah. it on top of that i mean forget about it. i mean what, what are some of the biggest challenges uh, you've run into with That's some a, particular games or you, you, programs you're just i just cannot do this you just will not <laughs> yeah. yeah that's that's a big one and that's such a big era of you know from like 1994 95 to 2002 ish in particular mm -hmm. that gets really tricky um but yeah i mean there's all these videos that video adapters and sound adapters and stuff that are always getting in the way and you know, capturing them is, is a whole different can of worms than just playing them or finding a way to play them. So uh, for me, like, and you know, when I, when I was doing more uh, game reviews, I pretty much did everything directly captured. Like I'd build a computer specifically for a game sometimes just to get it running as best as it could. That's dedicated. Um, That's dedicated. I bet you had fun doing that. It is fun. And typically that itself turns into a video, you know, so I was, uh, did one project where I was like, okay, I need, uh, a, a Pentium era, like an AMD K6. It's like 150 megahertz, but 200 is too fast. 100 is too slow. So I need this like exact thing. So I just made like a build video making that computer. And then I was able to actually record a couple of game videos using that thing. And it's like, uh, you know, I use it till it breaks. And of course now that one is broken. So <laughs> I haven't done anything with it since, but uh, yeah, it's uh it's kind of like a, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm catching up to my own projects and trying to turn each of those catch up moments into videos themselves. So it's kind of, you know, the, the upside and downside of doing sort of a hardware focused channel, I suppose, because things are always breaking and needing to be fixed or tweaked or something. But yeah, emulation is uh, also, it just, it kind of sucks for Windows 95, 98 still. It's getting better for sure. But yeah, there's, there's bits of, uh, you know, 3D acceleration. I just love a good voodoo card. I, I, I can't, you know, yeah. you, and that's, that's something that is only yeah. now getting to be emulated. So, yeah, was, that's just so brilliant. I can't tell you how many, how many days I've spent sometimes just trying to get a game to work. It never occurred to me, like, maybe I should film this, for, for, you know, this frustration <laughs> during this. Yeah. I mean, it probably may be me just dropping, you know, various curse words <laughs> the whole time hey you know Make it mon look monetize the pain right monetize the pain yeah, monetize the pain I should... <laughs> yeah i was uh you know i noticed in some of the videos i was watching uh, of yours you had some clips in there from computer chronicles 
Mm-hmm. You know, I love that show growing up. Sounds like you probably watched it a lot too. But I remember being a kid watching this and like, oh man, I would love the, you know, have that device, whatever this gadget is. It it looks, you know, so cool. Uh, and now being able to go back and, and get those things, you know, in a way it's kind of, I mean, how does it feel for you? Is it like, is it more of a nostalgia thing? Is it more like you're almost kind of an archaeologist? I mean, how, how do you, what does it feel like from your perspective? It really, it did start off as a nostalgia thing, you know, in, in terms of, uh, you know, that 2009, 2010 era was just picking up something that sort of struck a chord every time I went out thrifting or something like that and just found a, you know, oh, here's a game or a device I haven't thought of in forever, or, you know, I, I used to have this or wanted to have this. Uh, but after a while, you kind of do go through your own nostalgic minefield of, of, failed projects and you know you start running into the things uh, you know computer chronicles in particular has always been an inspiration for what i do and honestly like half of my videos have, have come from something i've seen on computer chronicles like i just leave it going in the background on uh, on many occasions you know when i'm working or just i don't know just for fun it's just fun to revisit and see the things that people thought were going to become things and you know that they don't ever really follow up it's like well whatever happened to that stupid card or that weird device or that goofy keyboard or whatever and so yeah i, I more so recently in i don't know in the past five or six years have like gone out of my way to find stuff that i never used or never heard of and you know that's yeah it is kind of like an archaeological dig sometimes just trying to figure out what in the world happened to these goofy ideas that people had and did they even work <laughs> at all you know sometimes they'll show them on computer chronicles and you're like mm, that demo seems a little forced i don't know if they were actually what were they really like you know so vcr under the counter yeah right you know it's like mm, i don't know what they're doing with that <laughs> you know all the roads that well, ended up being dead ends that you know maybe maybe they could be revisited at some point uh, too yeah the computer chronicles thing though for me was was great you know, I got to talk to Stuart. I had him on my show. And I think that was one right. of the most real experiences I've ever had. Because you just, you grew up with this guy. He, you're watching him. And now he's like in front of you. <laughs> oh, I love that. Of course, for him, you know, I guess this is, you know, he was doing all that stuff when it was brand new. You know, I don't know. Maybe it's almost cooler for us because we didn't actually get a hold of this stuff. <laughs> a reasonable price. And this, is, this is what I was thinking, right? Because when, you're, when we were kids, you know, I'm looking through the gaming or the computer magazines. You're like there's no way I could afford this thing, you know. There's no way I could build this this rig. But now, you know, you you could build like the dream machine uh, that you would have just done anything to have at like the age of 15 or 16. I'm sure you've done that <laughs> many many times at this point. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what is your ultimate dream machine? Oh, I think I've built a couple of them. So yeah, for the longest time, it was just that ideal 486 like top 20 dream machine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like uh, that, that. What ended up being the wood grain 486 was kind of my dream as a kid. Uh, that was, you know, the because I had a, a Packard Bell Legend back then, and it was kind of lacking in many ways. No sound card, no any, you know, just basic computer. But yeah, that uh, that 486 was sort of my early 90s dream. And then I went on to make like my late 90s dream with a, you know, really high spec gigahertz Pentium 3 and all the RAM in the world and you know, the, I've moved on to Windows XP. I just recently built a Vista computer, which yeah, makes so me that. feel I put terribly this old. Just for you, but <laughs> I noticed, I noticed. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's it's constantly moving up in years. But yeah, there's there's a lot of dreams, I suppose. But it's, it's kind of fun, too. I've been wanting to do like a, a video where you just like, you go through one of those old magazines, like Computer Shopper or PC Gamer. Oh, Computer or Shopper. Yeah, I think it was yeah. like. <laughs> just massive thick you know it's like a, a dictionary of computers parts but like every six months or so they would have this like you know the ultimate rig for such and such and like you know here's all the best parts that we've tested in the past year and they put them all in one thing and i've always wanted to put one of those together like exactly to spec is what one of these magazines did to see i don't know just i don't know why not uh i don't know if that's exactly the most algorithm optimized idea but i don't care it just sounds fun <laughs> like your odd your odd builds i think i got a clip here of your uh this is your wood grain oh Wait, yeah let's see about where do you show the where's uh, the, the comp 
completed thing is probably in the past, like last 10 minutes. Cause once I got all the wood grain on there, <laughs> it was sort of a, yeah, a process. Oh yeah. This is, this is the whole saga. This is like the five hour compilation of everything. I was doing it. Yeah, yeah. So that's <laughs> that's, great. that's the most recent iteration of it. Just tried to make it look like sort of a seventies, eighties hi-fi kind of aesthetic. So I see somebody like us, probably people watching this video are like, Wow, that's that's so cool. But you must run into people that are like, Why in the world are you doing this? Yeah, yeah, those are kind of the two types of people that I run into or you know, hear from. It's uh the folks that think it's just wow, that's so cool. Like, I wish I could do something like that. And then there's mostly folks who lived through it being like I left that stuff behind decades ago for a reason, you know, all the IRQ memory conflicts and all these things and just the pains of setting it, you know, making boot disks and stuff like that. Like you have to do it, but you know, it's kind of fun to go back when it's not like the only option you have and it's just something fun on the side. It would be a pain now if we still had to deal with that for like, you know, getting work done. But you know, if you're putting yourself through it on purpose, it's kind of fun to, to go through some annoyances. Oh, I remember, yeah, back in the day, you, you just were so paranoid. I'm, I don't want to break anything. It's, it's, I've just bought this $300 card or chip or whatever, whatever. Yeah, I remember just putting some RAM into my, uh, I think it was an Amiga 3000. And like the, there was such complicated instructions for that. And like, if you do this, if you mess this up, your RAM is gone. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I just think it's hilarious too with your, uh, <laughs> I was watching your, now I got to show this, this odd, we call it the odd tower. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was great. But uh, yeah, part of this that I had me laughing was you're building all this and then you realize that there's still like some cable there. There's some uh, piece that you need. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I just imagine that you probably have a, a huge supply way more that, that, you know, that I do. And I feel like I've got every cable imaginable back here somewhere, but, <laughs> but yet you still, now is it a problem of you don't have the cable or there's just so many back there and you don't, you don't know where it is. It's, it's a little of both. If I'm <laughs> honest, sometimes I'll be like, Oh, I totally, I don't have that. I got it. And it's like, it's in a box in an attic or a storage unit or something. Uh, but yeah, no, that I still do run into weird, you know, little adapters or just like there would be a perfect cable to adapt something uh, that is just, I maybe have something that's close to it, but you know, there's always different, slightly different pinouts or I don't know, something is just too big or too messy. Or, you know, I was, I was messing with something a while back where it was a SCSI device and it was an internal one. It was a 50 pin one. The only one that I had was 36 inches long. I'm like, ah, that's insane. Like, I don't want to put this huge snake of a cord in there. So uh, I ordered another ribbon cable online. It was like exactly the right length. So a lot of times it's stuff like that. Uh, just to avoid <laughs> silliness in the comments, you know, it's like uh, people are always oddly concerned about things like airflow. And it's like, um, you know what? You don't have to worry about that. It's an old thing. It's cool. <laughs> yeah, I think with this one, wasn't it something with this, uh, the fan? Oh, yeah, yeah. That, that fan like in particular. Turbo. It sounded like a jet engine when you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was just a random thing I got online and it turned out to be from some old server and I guess server fans of that size and profile or it sounds like a jet. It's, it's it really does. I mean, people should make sure you have the audio on when you're, you're watching this. Yeah, maybe I maybe turn it down. <laughs> yeah. That's a, it's a straight up vacuum cleaner on that thing. So I don't know. I, I guess it's fine in a server room, but very clearly not made for uh, computers at home. Yeah. Here's a shot here of the, you can see all the different devices on there. Yeah. I like the one that's that looks kind of like a fallout. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, sort, of, sort of uh, amber colored one looks really cool. Oh, I have it around here somewhere. Yeah. Oh, yeah, this thing. Musketeer 3. Yeah, that has, a, has a, got a vacuum tube in it. Oh, that is badass. Yeah. Vacuum tube really. Yeah, vacuum tube and uh, analog VU meter right there. Again, going for that hi-fi kind of look to it. It's it's just absurd that so many of these things existed specifically in the early 2000s. It's just, an, a, it's just a stupid time. Like that's when I started building computers myself for the first time is when all these kind of things were uh, new. And so, I don't know if they were ever relevant, but they were around, you know, and you always saw them in, again, computer shopper, PC gamer, like... 
uh, whatever. And it's just like, who would buy that? And very few people did, <laughs> judging by how hard they are to find. But uh, yeah, now I just, I don't know. That's always been one of my dream projects right there, honestly, was that tower. And so that was uh, really exciting to finish, finally. I wasn't even sure if it would all fit in one, but it did. It's a work of beauty. Yes. You know, like the, the cigarette lighter cracks me up. Yeah, and it works. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can know, light all kinds of things might, with it. Might be, you, know, you might want a cigarette, you know, in between uh, what doom sessions or Duke Duke. Yeah. Yeah, a, a particularly, yeah, yeah, light up a cigar while playing Duke 3D or something. Oh, or, perfect. Uh, there it is. See, that's yeah. what it's, the, it's for the cigars. And the other one I had had a pop out uh, cup holder as well, like a legit cup holder, not just the CD ROM <laughs> ah. <laughs> joke that you always heard. But yeah, the uh, the cup holder. So you could have, you know, your lighter right there and your your, your cup of whiskey or whatever to go with it. That's <laughs> a civilized, a little... that was a more civilized time. When we had yeah. That. Uh, a scary time too. I don't know, you know, putting those kind of things inside of a computer. Like when you turn that cigarette lighter on, it starts burning the inside of it just a bit and you can smell burning plastic. So other devices that are close to it start heating up as well. <laughs> so yeah, it's a little, it's a little dicey. Probably not the best thing you could have in your computer, but you know, you got to make sacrifices. Yes. Yeah. This the, I really like the tape player you had too. Yeah, that's another one of those that I actually do remember seeing in magazines back in the day, uh, specifically during the time everybody was trying to digitize uh, tapes and records and stuff to put them on MP3 because iPods were so exciting. So, yeah, it was a uh, was build as sort of uh, a tape recording device, even though it doesn't really record itself. But I've actually tried it out with uh, loading games from tape on like a Commodore 64 and then oh, transferring really? them over. And it, it works like that too, if you really want to. So you can, you can use it to, yeah, you can use it to load tapes and, you know, write into like a, a WAV file or whatever and load it in an emulator right there. So. Yeah. I was just thinking about those early two thousands again and looking through the computer shoppers in these magazines and there were all these, uh, ads for like backup ways to back up your machine on the like i think it was worm tape or something like that yeah. now i'm wondering like how much you know assuming somebody backed their stuff up with one of those sort of weird formats <laughs> i wonder you know could could you even retrieve it now Did, could you even find those i i have a couple of worm drives so that i could <laughs> zip, remember the zip drives yeah yeah zip drives and like shark drives and jazz drives and oh, jazz. Ditto. Yeah got a whole bunch of those right over there too yeah the imation super disc at the spark disc i'm just literally looking over my shoulder here <laughs> at all the different things yeah the avatar yeah there's so many stupid drives like that and every single one of them are obsolete and half broken yeah i remember those zip drives those are kind of a couple different brands i remember working i was working in a computer lab when those came out in the they had zip drives on every computer. You know, even back then, some of the techie folks were like, you know, I don't know how long this is going to be around. And really, the whatever the competition was, jazz, I guess. Uh, we only had the zip ones. I'm not, there were like two or three rivals, though, I remember. Yeah, yeah, two or three. Had their, their advocates. Yeah, those stuck around an oddly long time, especially in, like, businesses and, I mean, even schools. Like, I still occasionally get like an old, uh, like an ex college computer or school computer that was in, you know, decommissioned in like 2015 or 16. And it has zip drives in it. Um, I got one a while back. It had a magneto optical drive. I don't even know why, you know, like what was that even used for? I don't know much about that one, but yeah, it's pretty goofy stuff and all these things. Tape drives, of course, tape backup. That's kind of a fun one too. You know, it makes me wonder, have you ever found some type of peripheral or accessory of some sort and even you couldn't figure out what the heck this thing is <laughs> um i don't know i mean a, a few things like really make me question like the reality of things back then like why what in the world would they possibly uh even do with actually i mean i'm thinking about like the thing that's sitting over there uh but yeah you know weird little handheld devices keyboard things that have like just buttons all around them or something like I covered one a while back, the Twiddler that made no sense to me at all. It was like a cording device <laughs> is what they call it. The so. Twiddler? Twiddler. Yeah. 
yeah that it's, sounds a little bit questionable uh, it does doesn't it and it's just it's yeah, it's a, a twiddler. supposedly you can have an entire computer keyboard plus macros all in one hand so you know things like that but uh, after a, after a while yeah that thing the twiddle <laughs> Is it yeah. vi- please tell me this thing doesn't vibrate you know wait let me oh is this an ad for it uh it's got all kinds of different things in that video yeah there was a whole uh series of like cording devices so sometimes they end up being made for like folks with disabilities or you yeah, know I'm challenges sure. you know one hand things but with this it wasn't made for any of that this this guy like who invented it really thought it was going to be the future of like fast typing and it also has like a motion controlled mouse and everything with a, a mercury uh, like motion control. Th- it's just, I think personally a bad idea, but some people swore by it. And there's some people that still use them to this day. Apparently they came out in the comment section defending it. So, yeah, I was just looking at it. I wonder if maybe if you spend enough time with this thing, maybe it would. I'm, I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, it, it even said in there to spend something like several weeks with it to get, <laughs> <laughs> to get used to it and that just seems like a lot of lost productivity that you could use just you know using a like regular a keyboard it's like kind of a wii mode type of <clears throat> yeah i mean it has I motion can... controls in it the motion controlled mouse is in there so well i remember thinking nobody's ever going to like those wii modes and that sort of proved me wrong yeah for a good five years though those were the hotness oh look at that <laughs> <laughs> the twiddler yes I remember thinking this, you know, as a when I was a, I guess this is probably 2005, 2006, you know, showing PowerPoints and things like that to a class, and you're always wanting some way to like remote, remotely click the, you know, through your PowerPoint. Not nothing too sophisticated, but I remember going through several weird devices. <laughs> They're like way overkill. You know, it looked like you're trying <laughs> to control the thing with a Star Trek phaser. I've got one that you'd probably find pretty amusing. I haven't done a video on it yet. I don't even remember what it's called, but it's literally a um, an add-on. Again, I got it from a school surplus, and it goes on top of an overhead projector, the old school overhead projectors, and it overlays an MS-DOS-like VGA monitor on top of the overhead display transparently. Really? So that you can display what's on your, your screen on like your DOS computer through your overhead display and turn your overhead into a, a VGA projector. And uh, apparently that was used by some teachers for a while, especially in colleges to try to do presentations and things or just show class materials um, through an overhead and, you know, just repurpose what they already had. (laughs) No, I don't know if I'd have been in that class. I think I'd have been so fascinated with that. I don't know. I I know it would have been super (laughs) distracting. I would have been like, what is that thing? You know, (laughs) it's cool. Yeah. That's one I've been meaning to cover for a long time, but I just need to get it working. But I think it also came with like sort of a, a corded uh, remote peripheral to go through different slides and stuff like that. Yeah, I know you mentioned with your your cigarette lighter, you smelled some some burning plastic. I mean, you must occasionally just have comical mishaps where something explodes or oh yeah, <laughs> your, you haven't burned anything down. I hope. Um, not, not down. I have burned things, but you, know, you have that's... a fire extinguisher handy just in case. The... Yes. Yes. There's one in the wall <laughs> literally over there. <laughs> I've got a few of those hanging around. I've never had to use one, but I've definitely had to, um, you know, go to the wall and like click things off you know, when power is just getting a little out of, con- out of control and something's burning. Uh, but usually it's just something like a capacitor popping or a filter just poofing in the smoke, uh, you know, I was doing a presentation a while back at a local, uh, actually, community college. They were doing a retro computer thing, and I was showing off the original Macintosh. And somebody was literally asking me about it. Uh, yeah. Does that thing get hot? Because I know Steve Jobs didn't like a fan inside there. He was he hated fans. I'm like, yeah, it gets really hot, but it's fine. You know, it'll hold up still. And literally, as soon as we were talking about that, it popped, and some like smoke started pouring out of it, and it was just the hilarious timing. Uh, but yeah, all the kids there got to see a, a real-time computer um, capacitor death. So that was fun. Relatively easy to fix, though, I would, I would hope. Uh, Thankfully, those, yeah. It's just like a little a little golden you box. You the soldering iron. And the... <laughs> yeah, you got two leads to desolder and put back in. The hardest part is getting to it. 
um, especially on the Mac, because it's not meant to be worked on. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's not too bad once you get there. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me you're getting so much stuff from these school surpluses. You know, just remember, you know, I guess with uh, with schools, they get all this government money to buy all this technology and they have these big technology budgets. So, they're just, you know, companies just, hey, what, let's try to come up with anything. These teachers will buy it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> remember that you have any of those smart boards that they were make, pumping out back in the late 90s, 2000s? Those things are kind of. Honestly, I never I, saw. A, I've never seen a teacher use one. They're always in the back of the class. You know, yeah, ten thousand dollar thing that everybody was too afraid to touch. <laughs> I, w- I was I was in college when those started coming along, so like two thousand five, four, or whatever. Uh, and yeah, I remember seeing them. I think used once, <laughs> like at the beginning of the school year, and that was it. Um, No, I don't actually, I've never actually seen one of those come up for sale. It's probably because they're still hanging around in the back of somebody's class or something. Not, you know, like we're going to use it or, you know, we spent so much on it or (laughs) we're going to get our money's worth. I run into a thing too, like talking to, you know, different administrators or like the folks that are in charge of it. And a lot of times they can't get rid of those things because of like existing contracts still haven't expired or like, you know, the government or whatever local something, you know, they had a partnership with such and such company. And then, you know, the state said you can't get rid of it and all the, you know, so it, things just languished there. But yeah, I had that experience I was a, when I was at McNeese State one summer as a kind of a college freshman or high school freshman, kind of a, what do they call it, upward bound type, type of program. But, but anyway, <laughs> I was trying to bring a, my Commodore 64 to the dorm and, you know, my parents had brought it for me, but they, they left off the, I think it was the disk drive cable. You know, so I was telling the lab monitor about this, and he's like, wait, 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 wait what is it? I'm like, oh, well, the little disk drive cable. He's like, hold, come, come with me, come with me. <laughs> so I follow this guy, and, and this huge, I guess, it, I mean, maybe I was just a kid, everything seems bigger, you know, but it's like this warehouse, and it's like, come under 64, come under 64, like all these systems, everything you could you could ever want, and he you know, finds the cable, and he just gives it to me. And I was like, yeah, why do you have all these Commodore... And the 64 is here, you know, he's like, well, exactly what you're saying, you know, the contract, uh, they can't sell these, uh, they just have to store them, I guess, indefinitely. So it always makes me wonder, you know, how many of these on well, colleges and maybe even high schools, there's all these big warehouses just chock full of vintage tech. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like yeah. you found quite a, unearthed quite a few of those. On occasion, yeah, it's it's usually things get let out in trickles or whatever. It's like you know the day finally comes where they have to, you know, show that they've a lot of times destroyed the inventory. I found oh, they either have to. Oh no! Please yeah. don't say that they destroyed it. It's true. Like there was one. It's probably ten oh. years ago now, but they were destroying all their Macintosh lab, their original one from the eighties, and oh. they probably destroyed you know 50 or 60 like mac mac uh, se's fdhds and um some really early like lc's and stuff but <laughs> i knew the guy there and was able to I get one to, of i'd them. had to glue my hand to the macintosh i think to prevent that from happening you know? yeah it was really sad but you know thankfully when that much stuff is being got rid of some things tend to slip out something ends up in somebody's trunk or left outside to conveniently pick up later so um you know things do get out but it's it's pretty rare especially nowadays uh most of the stuff is either still languishing or was destroyed ages ago Mm -hmm. honestly we got some uh, questions here from matt shirky bradley a couple of people on discord a couple people on twitter to ask some questions they're really everybody's excited to see you by the way nice uh let's see so yeah we you we so you started doing game reviews, right? At which point did you feel game reviews were less interesting to do than hardware? And why did you, why you kind of pivoted with the occasional review here and there? So I guess you, yeah, your, your, I guess your focus has kind of shifted over the years, right? I remember you talking in some of your interviews about how you were looking for a niche and you, you got a lot of different interests, but you know how to balance the different audiences. <laughs> yeah, maybe we could talk about that a little bit. That's fascinating. Yeah, it, it does come down to that balance. It, the balance has shifted a lot over the years, but the, yeah, part of it's audience, part of it is personal preference, uh, part of it is just you know the money making side of things, like what things genuinely do better with, you know, ads or uh, the algorithm or whatever. There's all that YouTube stuff, but the algorithm, man, mysterious thing. Yeah, whatever that even means, it's always like deciphering tea leaves. But 
you know, uh, yeah, it, it initially started. Yeah, I mean, I was lazy game reviews when I started off, and I was just lazy. Were you making... ever lazy, or was that just a gag? <laughs> it was. It was pretty lazy at first. Yeah, pretty lazy. Um, lazy, or at least laid back enough, or laid you know, back. I was. Yeah, it was sort of a vibe, I guess, more than an action. But uh, yeah, it it started off that way, and honestly, back then, game reviews on YouTube were still kind of new ish. At least I didn't see too many people talking about like old DOS games or anything. Mm-hmm. Um, and that shifted quite a bit, you know, and then, you know, like Let's Plays became popular and then more in-depth retrospectives and, you know, more detailed game videos. And now you've got like video essayists and all this stuff that, you know, the people do like three hour videos about Fallout and stuff like that. Like I, I can never, I feel like I can't compete with that and I don't really want to either. So yeah, it's just uh, the, the general landscape of YouTube videos and, and what people are making and what I want to make is uh, just kind of moved on a lot over the past 15 years. And uh, yeah, it's it really did start off as a different landscape. I felt kind of um, like I was making videos that I wanted to see and that I wasn't seeing other people make. Mm. And now I see those videos that other people are making them. And, you know, you've got people covering the classic first person shooters and simulation games and RPGs and stuff that I would want to cover, but other people are doing them so well that I don't really see much need. I don't feel that I could add much, but what I can add is, uh, you know, covering the hardware that they were on or, you know, the, the peripherals and the setup and the process that all surrounded these games. Cause I think that's a, it's a big part of it too. And there's a bigger barrier to entry for people to go in and just, like you, you can't just go and acquire all this stuff overnight, right? Oh, it's your it's your moat, right? You have your yeah. moat. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, that's sort of um the area that I've carved out for myself and the audience has kind of carved out along with me in terms of, you know, feeding back what they want to see. And it's less games, but they're still very much under the current of everything. There's always a game in every hardware video that I do, pretty much. You know, I always go back and forth with that too, because oh, like Diablo Four is a, a hot new game. Everybody's like, "Why don't you cover this? Why don't you cover this?" But you know, I'm always thinking, like, "Dude, is that an is that an Interplay mug you got there?" Yeah, it's actually from Interplay. <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> yeah. Even your mug is cooler than mine. Oh my god. Yeah, somebody sent this to me that that knew uh, some folks at Interplay back in the day that got this from clearing out the office. Have an Interplay mug? I know. Got to get you one. Oh, that's the. Uh, anyway, <laughs> what was that? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, but Diablo Four. But yeah, I'm like, there's going to be thousands of videos, it's super slick, you know, professional quality things. You know, why even do that? But you know, is that your thinking too, or is it? Am I just uh, maybe that's what you should do? I don't know. <laughs> partially, partially, it's. I feel like I would just be adding to the noise if I was covering something like that. And plus, I don't really have too much precedent covering it. You know, if something like a new Fallout comes out, uh, yeah, I'm going to cover that. I mean, you know, I covered Fallout 1 and Fallout 4 when that came out. And uh, I want to cover the others, but I just haven't gotten to them. So, you know, something really like I'm personally attached to and really love, you know, like a Sims thing or, you know, a flight yeah. simulator. We got to talk about the Sims at some point. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But it's, uh, yeah, it's it's always trying to choose what would actually fit in and stand out at the same time, I guess. Cause you know, if I were just to cover something like Diablo four, I think it would be really out of, out of place for my channel too, in a way. Uh, the original Diablo maybe, but I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> That's one of the ones that had a tough time getting a decent footage. Yes. I've tried that one as well to get footage. I kept getting like weird flickering and like I artifacting and I, I don't know. Same with Baldur's gate. That one's hard to capture as well. And there's certain games you think, I always go into them thinking, oh, this will be easy. It's a fairly recent game. You know, you could even still install it just fine. But you know, when you hit that, uh, when you start trying to record it, you just get the blank screen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, refresh and resolution issues and modern capture cards just aren't made for <laughs> games from 1996. Yeah, it was just, I was smiling through uh, your pain with that. I think it was the again the uh, odd tower video where you got all this set up and then you're like oh by the way i need to re it looks like i need to reinstall windows or a vista because i had the 64 bit and i actually mm-hmm. need the 32 bit and, and you get all the way done with that and well I, you know i didn't actually have to do that because you know like that is exactly my i, I can't tell you how many times i've been through that sort of rigmarole yeah 
yeah, that's as much a part of the experience as anything else. So that's kind of one thing I like to document is the <laughs> the not so rosy parts of nostalgia, I suppose. You know, I was thinking, uh, Clint, with one, I think one of the advantages of, the, of your content, you know, especially with all the hardware and stuff you're doing, is that it's very visual. You know, you get to look at sped up stuff where you're working on things. But you know, a lot of people tell me on my channel, they're like, well, I can just put the audio on and just listen to you, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. But like with your stuff, you got to watch it. You know, it makes more sense. It's a better fit for YouTube because you've got that strong visual element that you, you know, no, I, I doubt anybody just streams the audio only. They miss out on, you know, most of the footage. So pretty, I don't know if that was by design, <laughs> but it's, uh, pretty clever. Yeah, no, it, it definitely wasn't. But I guess I was just always drawn to YouTube and video in general because I've always been into that visual side of things. Like I get much more out of anything visual, especially when it comes to, you know, this kind of thing where it's such a hands-on process and, you know, seeing and feeling and, you know, in person smelling and hearing and all this kind of things, you know, it's uh, old computers are very tactile and I try to get that across in videos as much as possible. Yeah. You would lose a lot. Oh, magnificent it job of it. Yeah. Well, thanks. Yeah. I was thinking uh, there used to be a game I used to play all the time called street rod. Mm -hmm. that's a good one yeah I, I should do a video on that sometime but uh, it kind of got me thinking about the uh, guys that really like to work on old cars and there's a huge market for that they really like the the older the, the old deuce coupes and everything and i feel like that's kind of like our ver this is kind of our version of that it is <laughs> you know like, we're not doing cars but you know it's very similar kinds of things like we're getting under the hood you know you're doing an oil change <laughs> or at least a, maybe a water yeah. cooler change you know Is it, you see some uh, overlap there yeah especially when you start getting into uh you know getting an old beat up sort of junker a beater kind of system and then restoring it and you know you clean it up and you use a lot of the same like cleaning products and restoration brushes and all mm -hmm. these kind of things you know you're, you're sourcing parts and there's always like one guy that still has a stash of them or you know somebody's recreating a part or you know machining something or you know reverse engineering it so that you can get the the, the recreation of it that's no longer it hasn't been made in 30 years or whatever so yeah there's a there's a lot of overlap I actually i've talked to some car youtuber folks as well yeah. and a lot of the process is pretty similar and things that we you know deal with and you know always that that thing too where you can never find information about something while you're making the video, for instance, on something really obscure. But as soon as you post it up, there's like 10 guys that that's what they've done their whole life and they know everything about it. And it's like, you've got all these things wrong and you're like, Oh no. So it's a kind of a similar routine. It sounds like, and you know, collecting different vintages of things and you know, there's specific model years of computers when they, they tweak one little thing and, Thankfully, computers are a lot cheaper than all these cars. I don't think I can yeah, do cars. I would say they take up less space. I don't know, but some of those monitors, they, I mean, it doesn't take too many. <laughs> yeah, I was, yeah. Uh, one of your videos, you're like, yeah, this has even got the original stickers that were on the machine when it was in the store. And I was just thinking, yeah, I've heard car guys go on about that too. Like, this still has the decals in the, you know, the little the little bumblebee thing. Yeah. <laughs> Yep, that yeah, tends the, to fall off after so long, you know. It's just mm -hmm. a little minutiae that most people probably wouldn't even think about. You know, they just rip those stickers off right away. Yeah. Uh, Matching but, serial uh, numbers and things like that. Yeah, it's uh, it's there's so much to this hobby. Yeah, it goes deep. And there's also the fact that, you know, the the more complex you go the more you learn that you really don't know much about it uh, i find you know it's like i i keep thinking or you know earlier on it's like oh yeah this is really my area of expertise but the more i dive down into it i feel like i don't know much about it because i keep finding these these gurus these guys you know the gray beards and stuff that have this arcane knowledge of how these old systems work and you know the programming and that they were there in the metal for years and uh, yeah, just like talking to some of those folks over the years and, and learning from them is that's honestly probably about the most rewarding part of it, too, is just mm -hmm. learning how much you don't know. And then going and finding these guys and trying to get some of their information across, digest it for a YouTube audience and preserve it in a way. So yeah, it makes me feel better that you don't there's stuff that you don't know. But I was, just, yeah, I was thinking that, I don't, again, I don't know quite what it's like for you, but for me, the one of the reasons I do this kind of thing is the comments and the discussions and just meeting people. 
you know, it sounds like you've met some some interesting characters over the years. Uh, do they suggest do you? Do they recommend videos, you know, topics and things? Do you do, you do that, or is it just oh, yeah. you're going to do what you want to do, and then <clears throat> you know they follow you? How, how do you, uh, I guess, manage your fan base? Oh, I don't even, I don't know. Like, yeah, I try to <laughs> manage you. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. It kind of feels like the other way around sometimes. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, ultimately it does come down to whatever I'm interested in, but you know, sometimes if somebody can make a compelling enough point or, you know, show that there's some history there or some unexplained bits of something that's never been shown on YouTube or, you know, it's just, it's so out of the ordinary or unique enough that it could uh, turn into an interesting video. I can be convinced, but yeah, ultimately, you know, it, it's going to come down to whatever I'm interested in that week, <laughs> especially since I try to get things out, you know, every week ish. Um, and, and then in that case, like sometimes you just gotta, you gotta choose something you're more familiar with um, to get something done. Cause otherwise a lot of these things, I mean, it would be like a month in between videos if I were to just, chase those projects that I know very little about because they take so much more time uh, to get to and, and understand and, you know, dive into how they work and their history and who made them. And uh, it's hard to draw the line sometimes for sure. I bet there's a lot of fun surprises and discoveries that you make. I remember one of mine was the first time we opened up our uh, Amiga 1000 computer and we're just setting the panels, you know, to the side and we noticed there was like an autograph <laughs> It's like, you know, what's the word? I get inscription engraved. Yeah, you know, like an engraved. etching or something. And then I was like, that is so cool. Who would ever have noticed this? And this is like something nobody would ever have known that was there. You know, maybe some people working on these machines would know about it, but you probably come across a lot of those sorts of little, almost Easter eggs in the hardware. Yeah, there's there's surprisingly a, a good number of systems and, and cases that have like the little etchings of uh, somebody's name or have you even seen like, um, like an engineer's dog's paw prints, you know, uh, like little little messages to somebody. Or uh, there's one, the, one of the compact presarios actually has like a little cyclops head etched into one of the PCBs, like behind a chip. And like I remember finding that like years and years ago. I'm like, why is that there? I have no idea. I still don't know. But it's a <laughs> cool little thing. I'm, I'm assuming maybe it was like a code name or yeah, I don't know. Th those kind of things are always fun to uh, to see, but yeah, uh, I don't know. I, I kind of wish that there was uh, more of a database sometimes. <laughs> like, we could just put all these things in there because uh, I don't know. I feel like I, a lot of folks are doing the same work over and over in terms of the research sometimes because I'll see somebody else cover it and, you know, uh, they do see it or they don't see it. And they're like, where did that come from? And it's like, it was found out on one video 10 years ago, but then that information doesn't get passed along. So, yeah, it's a weird, it's a weird place to be in. There's so many folks that are just, I mean, obviously more interested in the software, but really there's all these uh, all the engineers and designers of the hardware. They had creativity and personality and quirks and eccentricities. You know, it's just fun to uh, to see that stuff. I remember the uh, the Amiga, again, the, the names of the chips, a lot of them were named after like girlfriends and ex <laughs> secretaries and whatever. Yeah. <laughs> like I think there's a chip in there, like a the fatter Agnes. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the story is behind that, but um, must be interesting. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, you do food too, or you review games like food. What's with the food? <laughs> uh, I don't know, actually. I, meals, I mean, so I can't really talk much, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I do have a food channel, but that's Nobody sort of a separate food. thing. Um, I don't know. I, I saw that question in there. I'm not I'm not quite sure. I, I I get where they're coming from. I don't either. The relationships between food. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. Okay, <laughs> let's just see about this one. Uh, what are his top three classic, up to 2000 and modern 2001 later adventure games? Oh, adventure games. Oh dear. Honestly, that's like one genre that I don't really do too much with. So I can't even really think of anything past like 96 that I've really played very much. Um, I don't know. I guess like Sanitarium, that was really high up there. Oh, I love Sanitarium. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that's probably the most like recent ish one that I've enjoyed from that era. 
and then like everything else i've played has been you know more much much more recent you know i call the kickstarter project uh, things like that that have come out you know broken age and uh mm-hmm. oh what was the one that uh, ron gilbert did that one was monkey really island and... yeah it was the it was oh, the more recent yeah what is that one called uh... yeah the one the detectives and stuff i can't remember right now i remember enjoying it though yes <laughs> Right onto my tongue, I, I know it's driving me nuts. <laughs> well, not much of an adventure person, as you could probably tell. <laughs> Back in the day, though, it was like, yeah, you'd probably be more interested in the ones that required like all the funky uh, FMV hardware and the, maybe some of the early CD ROM or maybe like the old virtual. Do you have a lot, any of those old headsets for VR? Oh, yeah, I've got, I've got a lot of those quirky games for that, I bet. Yeah, FMV stuff is, of course, always very fun, too. But, yeah, honestly, I never had any of that hardware back in the day. So by the time I did, that stuff was, like, it felt old and passe and weird and kind of goofy. So I, I got more into it as I got older. You know, games like Ripper and Harvester and things like that. Uh, those are fun to go back and revisit. But, yeah, I think the, the only adventure game I actually had, like, when I was young was, like, the Hugo series because those were free. <laughs> So Hugo's House of Horrors and Who Done It and all mm. that stuff. So yeah, just ripoffs of Sierra, basically. Yeah, Sierra and, and uh, of course Origin systems. Those aren't really adventure games, but I, you know, I always admired British or or uh, Gary and the way he was willing to make a game that would have these specs and like support hardware that probably one yeah. <laughs> percent of, of people would have. You know, all the mocking boards and all that stuff. Oh yeah, that's right. Actually, just got a mocking board recently. I need to use that on some like Ultima games or whatever, because that seems that seems fun. Yeah, the Apple II era, that in particular, that was you know, like the first computer I ever used was an Apple IIe, but I mean it was at school, so I didn't really get to do much with it. I've been getting more into it lately. It <laughs> you could have taken it apart. That would have been a fun experience. Probably a trip to the principal's office. Oh yeah, yeah. It barely let us touch it. <laughs> So, yeah, my school we had a, we didn't even have apples. It was a, a clone. I think it was like a Franklin or something like that. Uh, Franklin Ace we had an Apple. Ace. Isn't that an Apple clone? Yeah, it's an Apple II Plus clone, I believe. Apple II Plus clone. Uh, that's kind of interesting. Okay, well, let's uh, move on from that adventure games. You'd probably rather talk about the Sims. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, that, that was more my thing, I guess. Yeah, what is it about The Sims? I mean, it's probably one of the best-selling games of all time. Yeah, you know, it's only that. Um, yeah, you know, it's. Uh, I guess it goes back to just my original enjoyment of the Maxis simulation stuff in general. You know, Sim City and Sim Ant were some of my first games. Period. Oh, Sim so Ant. I, yeah, that's a good yeah. One. yeah, I just kind of kept up with them ever since. I was part of like the Maxis Maxims fan club back in the day. They'd send you things through mail and you know, all that kind of, I just sort of followed it. And there was this mystique, I guess, about the Sims for years because Will Wright was working on that for ages and didn't get it to come out until like 2000. And yeah, just picking it up. I don't know. There was something unique about it and there still is something unique about it. The, the whole, yeah, it's a virtual dollhouse, but it's also like the ultimate RPG in a way because you're constantly just creating literally anything you want any kind of life you can imagine any kind of house any kind of job any kind of situation at least in my mind as a kid uh or as a teenager i guess when that came out you know it was it was coming up with absurd situations and you know the the balance between like being realistic or being silly you know you could deal with paranormal stuff if you wanted to or you could have like the most boring office job person um Mm -hmm. i don't know it just it just always struck me in a way that was uh got my mind going i guess before the world was like inundated with sandbox games that felt really really open you know it's like just the feeling it gives you the sort of mood puts you in playing at the even the music and things it just makes you happy at least for me yeah it's <laughs> nice and chill and laid back and yeah it's just so you remember weird. when you first you remember the first time you played it oh yeah oh very clearly yeah how long did it take you before you had that thought oh no what if everything <laughs> is a simulation? Yeah. <laughs> now that 
honestly it was like me uh, yeah it was around the time i first saw the matrix honestly so (laughs) it was around the same time as the sims like i think i saw those like that in the same years like 2000 so uh yeah i was there definitely thinking about that i'm like oh what if we're all just batteries somebody's just controlling me yeah it's crossed my mind do you have a favorite expansion or favorite version uh, the Sims 2 in general is probably just, you know, just all of it. <laughs> it's it's pretty awesome. Um, and there's things to like about all of them. But yeah, that was sort of like the peak in my experience. Uh, expansions, I mean, you know, there's too many of them. So, <laughs> so screw that. <laughs> I don't want to think about expansions, mainly because I'm working on another one right now. The Sims 4 just came out with like the 14th expansion. I just, I'm so... I'm so tired of modern Sims, but the classics are great still. Yeah, I think you had a, uh, there was one that Matt was talking about uh, that you didn't like. Uh, I think it was a Star Wars. Oh, yeah. I refused to even cover that one. Just refused to even mention it. What is it about it? I, I don't I haven't looked at it. I, Eh, it was just, it was an overpriced cash grab to promote the Star Wars theme park. And it was like, you know, it cost more than a regular pack and it offered less. Uh-huh. And it, it just looked like the most cynical thing I've seen in a long time. And it didn't add anything of value <laughs> to it whatsoever, in my opinion. And again, it was just an ad for like a theme park um, from Disney of all people. And I just I just found it kind of gross and didn't feel like uh, like adding to their promotion, basically, especially since, you know, like I said, it cost more, offered less. I, I saw no value in it. So uh, yeah, what's not, just what's not to dislike. You know? <laughs> it's like a, it's earned the LGR stamp of disapproval. Pretty much, yeah. I still get people asking me to cover that one just because they want to see me roast it. But I, I, I'm kind of kind of done with roasting things. I I feel like I did that earlier on, and now it's like I'd rather find things that make my day better <laughs> mm-hmm. than make them irritable yeah that's a nice yeah I, I agree i don't i hardly i don't think i've ever covered a game that i just hated just for the sake of bashing it you know i just yeah I'm not yeah. not my there's people that are have a successful model on that yeah it used to be more of a thing especially earlier on in youtube there were a lot of angry reviewers and i tried it and it wasn't <laughs> wasn't for me yeah you don't seem like a you know i think part of you know we, what we first started talking about just being yourself being authentic you know, I'm not going to try to pretend to be all, you know, having a, a tantrum over some obscure, terrible N- Nintendo game. That, you know, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Life is short, right? There's so many great games, you know, to, to talk about. Well, well you also, like, you get tied into doing one thing, right? Like, if you were to dedicate any kind of amount of time to being angry, then people just want you to be angry all the time. And I think that would be a terrible place to be. <laughs> do that angry thing yeah <laughs> be angry. Podcast and you know yeah that would be terrible yeah well let's see if ssds and multi-core chips sped up your production process more generally is it easier making a show now than when you started it's actually very much the opposite i think um because you know it's Yeah, like I started off with uh, very simple stuff. No lights, basically no microphone, crappy cameras. It was fine. Like, you know, I could crank out a video in a couple of days. Mm -hmm. But as time goes on, you know, I want to improve and I start getting better hardware and hardware starts getting faster. And then video qualities of cameras start getting better. So you need a bigger SSD and a faster CPU and more of a GPU. And like, you know, it, it, it takes much longer to do things now than it ever did because the quality threshold is way higher. You know, now I'm filming videos in like 5k to sample to 4k and then, you know, have that whole process and each video file is like, I I think the last video I uploaded was like a 17 gigabyte video file to YouTube. So, you know, back in the day it was a few hundred. (laughs) Uh, So yeah, sure. Things are faster, but because everything else has gotten so much more involved and detailed and advanced, it's like it takes longer to master it. So it's an interesting take. Um, you know, I was thinking back when we first started doing a YouTube, it was, I want to say like a 10 minute limit. It was, yeah. You know, on the videos. Uh, but part of me, 
you know, I went back and watched some of my early stuff. And I, I think I, since it was shorter, you know, I had more time to like do funny and clever stuff with the transitions, yeah. you know, pop-ups and, you know, I, you know, spent hours on stuff that probably nobody even noticed. <laughs> annotations. I kind of miss annotations. Oh, uh, annotations. Yeah. So or even video replies. Remember doing video replies? <laughs> what happened to that? That was a fun feature. It was a fun feature. Oh, well. They need to bring that. I don't know. Sometimes I just don't understand what. No, no, are you exclusively YouTube or have you dabbled with some of the other stuff that's come out, <laughs> popped up over here and there? Yeah, I've, I've been on a lot of things. I used to be on Blip back in the day and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But yeah, YouTube exclusively now. Uh, there's really nowhere else. It, it comes down to the community, right? And the comments and all that feedback. Like that's where people are. Uh, that's, that's where folks are going to be. So I'm going to be there with them. But uh yeah, just a lot of requests. And they say, you should move to Twitch. You know, you get that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah even, I've tried. I've never used Twitch. I, I don't really know much about it. You don't really do live stuff too often, or do you? I don't know. Not really. I, I think I've, it feels like I've seen you do something. Yeah, every now and then. And that's like, I've, I think I can count on like one hand the amount of times that I've done it. <laughs> so it just never really appealed to me. I don't know. I kind of like editing things myself and. Yeah, yeah, I think I'm the same way. Yeah, make it look like you know what you're doing, right? <laughs> yeah, I guess you probably don't have a big crew that's working with you to produce these, you know, live. I think it, to do to do really good live stuff, I feel like you'd need some people. I I mean, honestly, people say that about even just doing YouTube at, at this level or whatever, but it's still just me. So, uh, yeah, it would be nice, I guess, to have people try to set that up and like figure out the kinks of of getting all the the streaming stuff figured out because i hate doing that i really do it's such a pain i feel like with your content i mean if you had people unless they they'd have to have a very very special skill set to really be an asset <laughs> otherwise it just yeah. be you, like having to explain everything yeah or like just you know even i've thought about like okay getting some people into like uh I don't know, just answer emails. Well, then you still have to have people that know about this stuff because a lot of the emails I get are technical or they're asking about vintage hardware and like, you know, uh, do you want this thing? Here's this this old device or this computer. And, you know, what do you think about it? Can we work something out? You still have to know about this thing in order to be able to respond to emails. So I can't even do that without getting somebody in who also knows. Uh, I don't know. So I'm just, I do it myself. It's fine. Have you ever been in... I probably should know this. I didn't look, think about it until now, but you probably have you ever been invited to go on one of those like Discovery Channel shows or what's the the, the ones where they're like finding vintage stuff? Uh, you know, like I they, don't think so. It's it worth the, what was a pawn shop, you know, where they go into pawn shop, pawn star, or something like that. Yeah, you know, you think there might be a niche there for uh, like, well, I just found <laughs> this this old compact. <laughs> what's it worth? <laughs> well, let's let's bring in LGR. <laughs> the most I've done is like contributed some stuff to shows that needed old things for filming. Like they were looking for a specific item for the set. Oh. So yeah, things like that. But like, you know, that's barely in the background or, you know, somebody wants to you know, like, like for instance, there was a, there was some, <laughs> I was a reality TV show actually that wanted to use some of my footage of an item. And they're like, Hey, can we just use your footage and, you know, license things out like that? And it's like, that's about as far as it's gone. Uh, I don't really, I don't know. I've seen a lot of YouTubers that do want to do TV, like a lot of them. It's like, that seems to be the next step level for a lot of people. And to me, that doesn't appeal at all. Right. That just sounds awful. Like <laughs> that sounds awful. Like I do this because I like doing things myself. <laughs> yeah. I'm with you. Um, this is a good question. I think. So what's the one piece of gear that your white whales? The super rare thing. I love yeah. I guess like the holy grail of LGR. Well, the honest answer is the computer that I had as a kid, but that's never going to happen because that's in a landfill. So, um, yeah, that was a Packard Bell Legend 700. It was a 486, but you know, I'll find another one someday. Uh, the the other the more interesting answer would probably be yeah, with like, the original stickers on it. I'm sure. Oh yeah, it's got to have the little Intel sticker had on there and all that stuff. Uh, I would say the other one is probably the IBM Simon personal communicator. It was like their version of the iPhone in like the early nineties. IBM was doing some funky stuff back then. 
Uh, and that that would be kind of a holy grail. Same with like the original ThinkPad, the 700T. Uh, yeah, look at that, Simon. That thing is nuts. I don't even know what I'm looking at here. Yeah, 1994. Communicator. It's kind of a smart, it was like the first smartphone in a way. So, yeah. and like the uh, the original ThinkPad back when it was a pad, the 700T model, I believe is what it was. It was actually like a, like a tablet again in the early 90s. And um, what was the model number on it? I think it's 700T, I think. 700T. Yeah, it was like the very first ThinkPad and it was a tablet. <laughs> which just seems really cool for the time so yeah very very t and g mm -hmm. you know you want you want whatever they're using on t and g i think that's the pinnacle honestly yeah if i could get like an l cars interface that would be a pretty whole grail thing you know just <laughs> you know touch screen like actually a functional l cars that would be amazing so have you have you revered something where the product was far better than you thought I'd say, honestly, a lot of the oddware things have ended up being mm. pretty cool. You know, that, that vacuum tube thing was not better. That was way worse than I thought. Uh, <laughs> but like that cassette tape thing, you know. I'm yeah. excited about vacuum tubes. It's, it's amazing to look at, but that's it. It sounds mm. terrible. And it's just, it's, it's a bad product. Uh, but, you know, some other things, yeah, they come across. It's like, uh, you know, some of the, the different peripherals. No, nothing's really coming to mind right now for the peripherals for some reason. I know there was like one or two that were kind of good, but yeah, like even the, um, Maybe you found an old printer one time that actually just worked. I mean, <laughs> that no, that's, that's never happened. <laughs> yeah. what um, about printers. I mean, with all these years and you still can't get a reliable, it doesn't matter how much you spend on the thing, you know, it prints about 10% of the time. Yeah. I mean, and even the old, especially the old dot matrix ones are always jamming and things are happening with the heat head, the, the head of the, the printer is heating up and melting stuff. Actually, no, the, the cross pad, the, uh, the, the, it was like a digital ink to notepad thing. So you would write on a notepad, like a physical paper notepad yeah. and it would instantly transfer it over to like digital files. That thing worked way better than I thought it would uh, covered that not too long ago. And that I kind of wish that that was still a thing. Yeah, the uh, the cross pad. The cross pad. Yeah. Oh yeah, I see the video for that. You want to take a second here? We can look at it. Yeah, yeah, that was a that was a neat thing. The fact that it works as well as it does was pretty shocking to me because. <laughs> yeah, there they're showing it on. Oh, uh, there's Stuart. Yeah, yeah, another one of those where it's like, oh, Computer Chronicles. I got to find this thing. <laughs> left -handed? Am I looking at that right? Uh, I think that I have this the like salesman person is left handed. Writing on. So you just write on that and it just pops up on your computer. Yeah, like the actual it goes, you know, it does it doesn't matter. You can put a whole bunch of paper and it doesn't doesn't get in the way of the the ink. So it's like an ink to digital thing. And it's just a regular ink pen with like a radio transmitter inside of it. So it turns ink into digital, which is pretty cool. So you don't need special paper. No, you can use any kind of surface you want. You can write on anything as long as it's on top of that uh, pad. Then the radio transmitter just turns it into into graphics, which is pretty cool. Vector graphics. Uses radio. Yeah, yeah, radio and like a uh, like a triangulation. I think of the transmitter inside the top of the pin, which uh, uses a quadruple A battery for power. So, well, this seems really cool. It is. It, it's surprisingly neat. Like, you know, and it, you, it, it'll uh, read your notes. You can train it with your own handwriting and it'll learn your handwriting again, pretty effectively. So you can is just. This is from uh, 1998 they had this? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I feel like sometimes we've, we've actually gone backwards. I agree. Like this was very ahead of its time and still seems useful, honestly. I mean, I would probably use this on a regular basis. Yeah, I actually heard from a couple folks that still do. <laughs> they they still keep like an older laptop around just to transfer the files from it. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. I've run into people like that. You know, they have a special piece of hardware. There's maybe this special, there's a program that only works on this that was specially built for them. So they'll be <laughs> still having these machines from, you know, 20, 30 years. And they're like, well, it gets the job done. Mm -hmm. Does what I need it to do. <laughs> 
<laughs> that is surprisingly rare. Uh, so you done some conventions, or have you done? Have you met up? Done, done kind of meetups with fans? Yeah, pretty much just at at conventions. All the, yeah, all the time. Yeah, yeah I've got a, a couple coming up here pretty soon. But yeah, I do the uh, vintage computer festivals, uh, things like that. Be fun. Yeah, doing a Long Island retro here pretty soon. So. Can people yes. bring in hardware for you to sign? All the time. Yeah. It's <laughs> I've signed some very strange things. <laughs> Your cost pad. Yeah. Uh yeah, right. That'd be a perfect thing. Oh uh, yeah. Well, it, all kinds of weird experiences. What kind of strange things? Uh I've had people bring in like um, you know, like uh we'll see what was that one guy he brought in like a full-on like a computer from his workplace it was like a terminal board i'm like can you do that i don't know dude but like i basically just signed on the top of it and he went around and got like all the youtubers to sign around the edges which seemed like a bad idea because it was a a computer keyboard he used because it's gonna wear off but anyway whatever um and uh yeah a lot of sims and duke nukem booklets and games of course people bring those in say duke nukem that the video where you're trying to play duke <laughs> nukem with, the, with the ir <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh my god oh. yeah there's always something more ridiculous to play duke nukem or doom with <laughs> uh well yeah i guess that's about all the questions i got well there's this let's see one other one how is the local retro PC gear scene in your area? I bet you're kind of a celebrity when you walk into the local PC gear shop. Oh. I mean, surely they know who you are. If I had one, maybe. Uh, I live in the Appalachian Mountains, so there's nothing. And no. There's nothing out here. So, yeah, honestly, I wish we had. I wish we had something like that. But like you know, the nearest computer store is like two and a half hours away. So not even really an option um but yeah anytime i do go to somewhere like a micro center or something it's definitely a bit of a thing <laughs> i've That's had awesome. uh yeah last time i went to one we had like three or four people like crowding around and just like here let's let's try this thing it turned into like an on-site like demonstration of an lgr thing so we were just like looking around for the weirdest peripherals that they still sell at micro center which surprisingly they still sell a lot of old stuff like stock from the 90s still at least to the one we went to so like uh yeah like the like old serial and parallel Race port graphics cards on the box I, I always like that ray tracing stuff too oh yeah yeah ray tracing is fun yeah, I guess yeah old ray tracing new tracing but, yeah you know because i remember watching some of your old videos back in the day and you'd have a uh, you'd have like special glasses right with the camera and you'd slip into the thrift shop and you know uncover stuff i bet it's kind of hard to do that now because everybody knows you're right yeah, it is more of a thing where I do get recognized. Uh, people actually specifically go a little bit more. Maybe you need like <laughs> a big floppy hat. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Yeah, honestly, most people don't bother me when I'm actually filming, but they'll kind of like uh, I'll know because they're just sort of like watching from the side and uh, kind of waiting for me to stop filming because I do it with my phone now. It's a little more conspicuous, I guess. But uh, yeah, the, the the filming things out in public. <laughs> that's always an adventure you never know i don't think that's about all i got for you all is, right is there anything else you want to talk about we didn't chat chat about uh well i don't know i guess uh we could do um let's see make sure everybody has a copy of dungeons desktop so oh, that's there wonderful... we go. <laughs> <laughs> just want to do a little a uh, little little uh, promotion of the guy here nice it's a really good too, dear. I was seriously just recommending that to somebody the other day because I just put up a bookshelf upstairs and somebody's like, what is this? This is awesome. So I think they might have ordered a copy. Yeah, thanks for that. I think, didn't you write a review of it too? On uh... I, I'm pretty sure I did. I've had both editions. So. <laughs> 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 well, you are too, man. I've always enjoyed your stuff. Like, I don't know. There's something about your vibe, like the stuff that you do, things that you work on and like make sure that I don't know. I feel like a similar like sort of camaraderie and just making sure that things are out there and preserved publicly for people to access for free. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know. I, th I find that's important and that it goes from, you know, videos to, to archiving software and, and manuals and things like I love doing that too. Like I was doing that before even YouTube. And that's kind of what got me started in making videos in the first place is because I was getting all these things and putting them out there on uh <laughs> dubious mm -hmm. websites at the time but now we have internet archive and things like that where you can just put that out there and make sure it's all preserved 
And I think that's important, you know, legalities be darned sometimes. Yeah, I was just, you know, reading about how the, I guess it's the ESA, is that right? Yeah, what, yeah. Electronic, I forget what it's, it is to be one of those. Software Association. I mean, they've always kind of gone after these abandoned worst sites. I mean, I, I understand it to a certain point. But on the other hand, some of the stuff they're talking about, you're not going to get that game anywhere else. No. Oh, no, games and manuals and soft, like, you know, I, I'm constantly uploading driver discs and, you know, compilation packs and stuff that came with all these old devices and, you know, things that people threw away. And you know, there needs to be an archive of that stuff because there's people still using it here and there. And so, uh, I don't know. I think it's all important to some degree, but you know, especially the games, you know, the fact that that's such a thing <laughs> in the news lately with uh, the lack of preservation and you know, oh, yeah. uh, yes. things under attack. Uh, you, if you read, I'm kind of a history buff, I guess, on the side, you know. <laughs> but one of the things you always you quickly discover about that is that we don't know like what's going to be historically relevant Sure, you know, 50, 100 years from no clue you know the stuff that we think's important and is popular now i mean that might just be a footnote and we're sitting here with this thing that nobody is paying any attention to and that's going to be the thing that oh my god why not wouldn't it be great to have this you know prototype or this manual or this manuscript you know you know this sort of thing it's never what you expect well yeah it's, it's always kind of a thing too where you see like uh, some of the most valued documents from back in the day are like it was basically trash or it was somebody's note to somebody that got left behind on stone or parchment or, you know, it, it, it ended up being a key to some other find or, you know, you never know what's historical. And a lot of times the historical stuff is trash. <laughs> so in a time, like it might not seem Maybe important. a thousand years from now, they're like, yeah, we were up in the Appalachians and we found this trove. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just this ridiculous basement full of CRTs. What must have been doing? a shrine, a temple. Yeah religious uh <laughs> religious artifacts like the, the cross pad and uh, the vacuum tubes <laughs> this guy really had ibm like uh, up on a pedestal for some reason <laughs> okay all right well thanks again for doing it's been a pleasure likewise uh, yeah i hope we don't I hope this isn't the only time we'll have to have you back at some point i'm sure hey anytime honestly Thanks again, folks. Again, you probably know where to find his uh, videos. Just look on YouTube. LGR, it's right at the top. <laughs> I'll put some That'll links. Do. To, I'll put uh, some links to, to the videos he talked about here today. And it's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, definitely had a lot of fun. It's always fun to, to talk to fellow YouTubers. See ya. Uh, See what things look like from their perspective. You know, I should probably do that more often, that kind of thing. Uh, it's really interesting to compare notes. And, and man, you got to just, you got to admit that guy's collection. Fantastic. I re really wish I could go see it sometime. Uh, anyway, I couldn't do any of this without you. So thank you very, very, very much for supporting uh, my show. Uh, I, you know, always thank you guys. And say how grateful I am. Uh, that some of you are willing to, to step up, not just watch the show, not just like the show, but actually financially financially support it. Keep it on the air. Keep it in production. Uh, so I really, really appreciate that, guys. Uh, if for whatever reason you're still on the fence, you're not sure you swear the money or what, you know, whatever is holding you back, you know, just consider we have a kick-ass uh, Discord community, lots of like-minded fans, uh, people that are into the same stuff you are. We'd love to chat with you. We'd really like to have you. Uh, so, you know, please consider it. Uh, you might do it just to support the show, but you might also like meeting uh, some like-minded people join this rather impressive, rather excellent community of match headers that we've uh, assembled over the years. So please do consider that. A link in the show notes to the Patreon site. You can sign up. It's quick, it's easy, it's painless, and you'll like the show 10 times better if you financially support it. I promise you that. All right. Uh, what about that news from the Met Cave? Oh, the news. Well, you remember John Romero? Have uh, you heard of this guy, John Romero? <laughs> yeah. Everybody knows John Romero. One of the coolest. You know, he really is. You know, it's uh, you hear this term rock star get thrown around. You know, he's a rock star. Blah, blah, blah. I mean, this guy really fits that 
you know, short of being on stage with a guitar, you know, he's about as close as you can get. Got the look, uh, got the style, got the attitude, got the ambition. Uh, and he's also got a book. <laughs> he wrote a book. <laughs> Why not? It's called Doom Guy, Life in First Person. So I guess he's tired of, tired of being written about, wanted to do the job himself. Uh, so in this book, it says he uh, pulls back the veil to reveal the man behind the myth. Recalling his tumultuous early life, his storied career at id Software, and all the missteps and, success, and successes along the way. And after, too. Uh, he even talks about Daikatana in here, of course. Now, you can get this on Amazon. It's $12, basically, on Kindle, or $27 for the hardcover. Pretty cheap. You know, I thought it'd be a lot more for a hardcover version, so I would pick that up pretty quick. Now, I haven't checked this. I just now thought about it, but I bet there's probably some way to get a signed copy, too. Maybe if you uh, talk to John on, uh, or talk to Romero on Twitter, he's pretty active there, you might figure out how to do that. Now, that'd be even cooler. But anyway, congratulations, of course, to Romero on this. Hope it does really, really well. If you read it, by the way, let me know what you think. All right, moving on. Diablo 4. Yes, well, they've uh, apparently stepped in it. Uh, they did a recent patch. It's 1.1.0. 1 .1, 1 .1 dramatically reducing player power across the board. Now, I haven't played this game yet. Sounds like I was, I was pretty lucky, actually, not to have played it up to this point, because, wow, it seems like they really took the hammer to their player base with this, at least the people that really sink a lot of time and money into developing their characters. So we got reductions to XP earned, diminished roll to status effects. <laughs> Just uh, kind of a, sounds like a really big time nerf, as they say. You might remember, I remember something like this happened with Star, Star Wars Galaxies back in the day, and it, it pissed people off so much it never really can't recover it after it. You know, just such a huge thing. You know, I guess they feel like they have to do it for whatever reason. <laughs> you know, things get too unbalanced, but man, you know, you think they would have done something a little better than this. Apparently they do a damage control, uh, but I did uh, talk about this a little bit on Discord, that community I was telling you about, and Colescob uh, uh, said, Really, they just, they've reached peaked Activision, <laughs> is how he uh, prefaced his, uh, or, yeah, pretty sure his, uh, or there. Let's just go with their comments on uh, Discord. So you can check that out uh, over on the Matt Chat Discord channel. Uh, and then last but not least, remember uh, World of Darkness and Vampire the Masquerade? Of course you do. You know, it's, <laughs> it's really great. You know, vampires, uh, you know, post-apocalyptic stories, vampires uh, in fantasy. You know, those, those are probably the top three options. There's a little bit of science fiction too, but uh, wouldn't you say those make for the best RPG games? Uh, well, uh, Spencer Boletieri at CBR.com thinks it's time we had a World of Darkness movie. So that Dungeons and Dragons movie did so well, why not branch out and do some of these other, uh, other games? He says, Having once sported a full television series in Kindred, The Embraced, which, by the way, I've never seen. <laughs> didn't even know that, you know, I didn't even know that was a thing. Is, is it any good? Uh, anyway, uh, Spencer thinks a movie seems like the perfect way to explore the rich mythology of Vampire the Masquerade. Captivate a greater audience and revive interest similarly to the successful D&D movie, Honor Among Thieves. So I'm intrigued by this. I like a good vampire movie. <laughs> you know, it's kind of fun to think... You know, what storyline they would pursue, what, what characters, uh, and, or who would uh, they cast for these roles, and so on and so forth. So, yeah, what do you think about that? Would you go see this movie? Would it be something you get, you get excited about? Or are you kind of like, <laughs> you know, oh my God, I hope they don't, I hope Hollywood doesn't ruin something else for me. You know, what, what's your attitude these days? I'd like to, like to hear. All right, what about that ale of the week? Oh, yes. Oh, well, I got one more of these busty lushes left. Uh, I wasn't able, there's three flavors apparently. I was only able to find two. This one's the uh, She's Passionate Tropical Weiss, or Weiss, W-E-I-S-S-E. -S -S -E. You know, it's a German word, I think, right? Weiss, Weiss. There's something about W's in German I'm, I've never been quite clear on. I don't speak German, obviously. But I'm pretty sure that's pronounced Weiss. I, I could be completely wrong about that. And let's see, non-alcoholic malt beverage contains less than 0.5% alcohol by volume. So again, with these, you know, it's good if you don't want to get drunk, you don't want to get intoxicated, but apparently there's still some trace amounts, you know, so if you got a, 
you know, some reason, if you want ze absolutely zero, then you'd want to avoid this product. You know, same with the kombucha. So let's see, packed full of island fruit, harmonious sour character, and a bright tart finish. Close your eyes and enjoy a mini vacation to a tropical paradise. Enjoy this vibrant malt beverage chilled. Celebrate beautiful and unapologetic women. <laughs> yes, they have a kind of a women focus on uh, from this company. Uh, I found this again, it was at a home goods store for whatever reason they had these. Uh, so anyway, well, let's pop this open and see what it's all about. Oh, the busty lush. And I thought it'd be appropriate to pour this into a centipede glass because if memory serves, the game Centipede was also created by a woman. I don't remember her name right off the top of my head, but I did get to meet her one time. Out of all places, it was a college uh, composition conference. She's a professor now, <laughs> doing the same, basically the same thing I am. <laughs> That's pretty uh, pretty small world, isn't it? Well, there you go. You could probably see that nice head on this. A lot of uh, bubbles, a lot of action. Yeah, it's very active, very bubbly. I like to see that. Uh, it does smell like one of those kind of sour beers. Very fruity, tropical, just like they said. I think. Uh, let's see. Where's my? Yeah, there we go. Oh, where's your drinking horn? Get this into your busty, lush drinking horn. <laughs> I can't get over the name. <laughs> busty, lush. That's, that's fun. It's a very uh, sort of irreverent attitude you kind of want from somebody making beer, I think. It's, you want to be a little bit feisty. Well, it smells uh, pretty much the same as <laughs> it did in the glass. Uh, let's go ahead and give it a swig. Well, it's okay. Very sour, very citrusy. Uh, they did say it would be tart. <laughs> Not, that's certainly true. Very tarty, tartish, tarty, tarty, tartar. I don't know. Uh, kind of a lemony lime uh, flavor on the going down in uh, the aftertaste. Very, very citrusy. Very orange rind, uh, lemon peel, uh, lemon zest. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. It's very uh, sour indeed. Sour, see, uh, sour and citrusy. Let's try it again. Yeah, it's a, <clears throat> I think they described it really well on the can, uh, those flavors. Very tropical, sour again. Uh, this one, I would have to say, uh, I wouldn't think I was drinking a beer. If you just pour this into a glass and like, here, have this. <laughs> you know, it kind of looks like a beer, but it really uh, tastes more like some kind of a, uh, I don't know, low sugar, sour, tropical sort of uh, soda that you might get. Let me try uh, from the glass. Yeah, it's not bad. It kind of reminds me of like an Arnold Palmer. <laughs> it had one of those, what is it, like sweet tea and uh, lemonade mixed together. Uh, more, maybe probably more lime than lemon. I mean, that's okay. Um, you know, nice beverage, but again, uh, the other one tasted exactly like a beer. And it was supposed to taste like an oatmeal stout. And, you know, my God, unless you said, hey, this is non-alcoholic. Uh, oatmeal stout. I would have had no. I would have had no reason to question that. I would have drank it, assuming the whole time it's just a regular oatmeal stout. <clears throat> now this one doesn't really taste much like a beer at all. It's more like I said, kind of like an Ar Arnold Palmer uh, sort of soda. You know, obviously there's no alcohol fumes or anything. It's <laughs> not non-alcoholic. So uh, I don't know what to think about this one. You know, I guess uh, <clears throat> if you like tropical flavors and you want something that kind of looks like a beer, you know, you might go with this. Uh, but if the goal is to find something in a non-alcoholic format that still sort of feels and looks and tastes like a, the real thing, uh, you probably don't want this. You know, so unless you like that kind of flavor and, you know, disconnected from any uh, uh, alcohol connotation, uh, you know, I'd probably pass on that one. Uh, I'm going to go, uh, you know, again, it's kind of hard to rank these things, but, you know, just in terms of non-alcoholic alternatives to, to beer, I'd probably go maybe one or two out of five on this. I'm not nearly as impressed with this as I was with that, uh, uh, that oatmeal one uh, that I tried last time. So let's just go two out of five. Seems about right. It's not, it doesn't taste bad. Uh, it's not unpleasant, you know, nothing like that. It's just not exactly what I would be looking for if I was on the uh, non-alcoholic aisle, you know, trying to find a good, a good substitute. 
Uh, so anyway, let's wrap it up with a quotation. And I found a quote <clears throat> from Algis Huxley. I really like this quote. I think it's uh, fitting. <coughs> Fitting for this episode, all the collecting and, and the history and archiving, things of that sort, goes something like this. The secret of genius is to carry the spirit of the child into old age, which means never losing your enthusiasm. So stay enthused and see you next time. Goodbye in their own way. Playing outlawed tunes on outlawed pipes. <laughs>